Hi, everyone. I uh, wanted to welcome you all back from the, the break. And um, I, uh, my name is Mike Devaney. I'm an assistant professor at Duke University, and I'll be moderating the next panel. Uh, I just wanted to take some time to, to thank you all for, for attending uh, on, a, on this Saturday and um, thank the speakers from the previous panel for speaking on a highly relevant topic. Um, I think, you know, at least uh, personally, I, I wouldn't be here if I didn't have additional help with childcare today. And, uh, you know, I imagine most of you are all kind of had to, to make some arrangements in your schedule to attend. So, so thanks, thanks for doing that. I, uh, I, I think this will be a really great um, panel to, um, to follow the first panel. Um, the panel is uh, that I'll be moderating is called Maximizing Your Scientific Impact. And um, we really mean more broadly, just maximizing your, your academic impact overall is this, you know, this panel will also be relevant to um, folks in the more of the educational sphere than the science sphere as well. Um, I'll start by um, a brief introduction uh, of the speakers, and then there will be recordings to follow of their presentations, and then we'll have a 15 minute uh, question and answer session uh, afterwards. Uh, similar to the last panel, you can put some questions in the chat and I will try to organize them and, um, and bring them up at the Q&A panel. Um, and then uh, speakers that uh, can also kind of respond to those in the chat as well. Um, so our, our, first, uh, our first speaker is Dr. Jean, Jean Francois Petit, who is uh, the David Hill Chestnut Endowed Professor in the Department of Anesthesiology and uh, Perioperative Medicine at University of Alabama, Birmingham. He runs an NIH funded laboratory investigating how trauma and critical illness causes long term and organ injury and death. Um, and particularly focuses on mechanisms of acute lung injury after sepsis and trauma and on the mechanisms of post traumatic coagulopathy. He has authored over 266 peer-reviewed manuscripts and is the editor-in-chief of Anesthesia and Analgesia. Um, he will give the journal's editor's perspective on maximizing um, your impact as a young investigator. I'm really looking forward to learning from his talk. Um, Dr. The next speaker is Dr. Ed Mariano, who is a professor of anesthesiology at the Stanford University School of Medicine and is also the chief of the anesthesiology and perioperative care service at the Veteran Affairs Palo Alto Healthcare System. He has held uh, numerous leadership positions and is currently president-elect of the California Society of Anesthesiologists. He has uh, developed techniques and patient care pathways to improve post-operative pain control, safety, and other outcomes. And he has published over 200 peer-reviewed articles and book chapters. He has significant experience using social media to enhance academic careers, and he is one of the top 10 anesthesiologists to follow on the social media platform Twitter. Um, and today he'll, he will be discussing uh, self-promotion using uh, social media. And I'm really looking forward to hear, uh, hear and learn um, about that topic. Um, and, uh, and I also should put a plug in that we do have an account for early stage anesthesiology scholars on Twitter. Um, that you can follow, and I'll I'll put a link to that in the in the chat. Um, and our third speaker is uh, Dr. Mary Beth Brady, who is a cardiac anesthesiologist um, and associate professor of anesthesiology and critical care medicine at John Hopkins Johns Hopkins University, and she is also the vice chair for education um, in the in the same department, in which she coordinates educational initiatives across multiple campuses. She is nationally known as an expert of transesophageal echocardiography and serves as a director of the Interoperative Transesophageal Echocardiography Program. And she has won multiple teaching awards um, for, for her endeavors at Johns Hopkins. She has um, previously developed a curricul curriculum for presentation skills, um, which she uses uh, to mentor uh, trainees at Johns Hopkins. And today she will speak specifically on um, presentation skills and improvements um, in, in those skills. Really look forward to hearing about that. And I look forward um, to the upcoming Q&A session and, and panel afterwards. Um, so I guess we could uh, get started with the first, first talk.
Uh, good morning. Uh, I am Dr. Peter. I am professor of anesthesiology and surgery at the University of uh, Alabama at Birmingham, and I will do an appointment, secondary appointment at UCLA in Los Angeles. Uh, I would like to thank you, um, uh, the East Scholars Organization, to invite me to give a short talk on the journal editor's perspective as I'm editor in chief of Anesthesia and Analgesia. I do not have any disclosure for this presentation. The objective of my lecture uh, are twofold. First, I, I want just to show you a few slides. How can the editor help you to publish in IOS journal? Because my journal is Anesthesia and Algesia. And the second question is what should uh, you do to be successful in publishing in these journals? So the first question, how can the editor help you to publish in IRS journals? I think uh, the, the general concept, which is really important, is that publishing is a business. The authors and readers are our customers, and therefore uh, we need to treat them very well. The second issue is that we want to offer a home to the anesthesia community to publish academic work. So the question is, what kind of article uh, do we want? Our journal is largely a clinical journal. So we want articles addressing important perioperative problems, articles providing responses to current gaps in perioperative care article explaining how anesthesiologists may be dealing with this problem and articles demonstrating some potential solution for this problem. Uh, as publishing is a business, we do encourage uh, authors to contact the editorial office for any question that they may have relative to the submission of an article to our journals. Uh, handling editors and myself are always available to answer questions regarding the decision letter that you receive about your submitted article. Very importantly, we do not accept any inappropriate comment in the decision letters, comment com that would come, for example, from a review board that uh, doesn't like uh, the, the paper that you sent to us. Finally, also important uh, is that an appeal against a decision is always possible, but needs to be well justified. I want to uh, review quickly the peer review process. Uh, there are traditional uh, peer review process that we are uh, using for our journal. Uh, largely, the single blind author do not know who reviewer are, but the reviewers and the editor, the ending editor, know who, uh, who the authors are. Uh, and I think this is important because the author know only who is the editor. We have encouraged people to uh, put their name on a uh, uh, on a review if they decide to do this. But when we are dealing with younger reviewers, sometimes they are uh, concerned to put their name, particularly if they have uh, serious criticism about uh, an article. The second uh, uh, classical way to review paper now is when the paper is submitted to uh, 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 preprint server like BioArchive, MedArchive. So here, uh, in this case, as is shown in this slide, you uh, add a, a level of complexity because when the paper is published in a preprint server, the public can access to the preprint server uh, and the paper before peer review and make comment improvement. However, the paper also is submitted in this case to our journal and either is public, it goes to the public after acceptance. If it's rejected, it goes back to the author and they, they, it can go back to the, the preprint server or to a different journal. So I think 
the advantage of the preprint server is certainly that you may have a good comment and improvement. The problem we may have is that two things. We have two DOI, one for the published paper and one for the preprint server for the same study. Number two, uh, particularly for clinical study, uh, is it could be of importance that we have um, uh, uh, we, we have already a statement published that may have not been peer reviewed. Uh, there is another uh, way to do peer review process, which is the open peer review process. In this case, authors, reviewer, and editor are known to each other. The article is available online before the review process. Reviewer reports are disclosed along the articles, and the different versions uh, during the review process are available online. There is, uh, there are some journals doing this, the BMC Pharmacology and Toxicology, for example, and the F1000 Research Journal that is very famous for this. When should you publish? This is an important question. If you publish too early, you may have a premature uh, publication. If you publish too late, uh, you need to be aware of potential competitors. So what are we recommending? We are recommending that uh, you complete around 70% of your research before publishing. You may consider a short communication to mark your research territory. Um, I think also this uh, early uh, uh, publication, particularly the feasibility study, are becoming very important now uh, before you submit uh, a major grant for a large clinical study. I think you will need to present something which is novel and you have to be strategic in your uh, publication. I don't think you should publish anything you plan to patent. As you know, the patent cannot be uh, obtained if the, there is already publication. Furthermore, do not split your research into too many publications to avoid salami silence. Before the submission, what you should do, the, do, the to-do list. Well, you need to format your article using author's guideline. Find an appealing title and catchy keyword, and prepare an impactful cover letter. I think it's important because the cover letter may be very important because you have only one shot and you should try to get it right. What should be in a cover letter? You need to convince the editor that your paper is of importance. Why is the, the paper fits does fit in a journal scope? Why are the, why the reader would find it important? Why the paper is important for the field? And is it really original? Uh, I think you should also highlight the novelty and impact, give a brief, largely non-technical summary, but uh, the work in the context, explain briefly the specific advance over previous research and potential application. The next issue is the how you decide who should be an author of a manuscript. This is an important issue. It's been addressed uh, during the IRS meeting by Dr. Karaj, the editor-in-chief of anesthesiology during the, our journal symposium. But I want just to summarize here. Uh, the criteria to be an author of scientific manuscript include the fact that you have to have substantial contribution to the conception or design of the work or the acquisition, analysis or interpretation of the data uh, included in that work. And you need to be involved in drafting the work or revising it critically for an important intellectual content. And you have to give a final approval of the version to be published. And finally, you have to agree to be accountable for all aspects of the work in ensuring that question related to the accuracy, integrity of any part of the work are appropriately investigated and in resolved. What does this mean? It means that every single author of a paper is responsible uh, for the integrity of the data presented. 
I like to just mention again uh, conflicts of interest. I think is important. Anesthesia and analgesia are all that the conflict of interest exists when professional judgment concerning the primary interest, including patient welfare or the validity of the research, may be influenced by second interest, like but not limited to financial gain. Uh, I think the perception of conflict of interest are as important as an actual conflict of interest. I would add here that it is okay to work with companies that provide devices or new medication and, and to study them. However, it should be very, very clear who is doing the work and, and uh, that if a company is involved, the people who are doing the work should uh, have done this separately from a financial gain. Uh, what is the definition of scientific misconduct? It's really important. Scientific misconduct is either a fabrication, what it is, making up results and reporting them, falsification, manipulation of research material, equipment, or processes, or changing or omitting results so, so that the research is not accurately represented in a record. The last part is important. Uh, when you do a, either a basic science uh, or a clinical study, if you have outliers uh, and you decide to eliminate them for no reason so that the results are more uh, concise, I think it, it is misconduct. You cannot do this. And I think we see once a while this situation. Finally, the plagiarism is, is important if it's the appropriation of another's idea without giving the proper, the proper credit. Uh, the self-plagiarism, particularly when it is about the method of a study, is acceptable as long as that the, the proper credit is given to the people who did the previous study. What are the criteria for scientific misconduct? That is important. It represents first a significant departure from accepted practices. It has been committed intentionally or knowingly or recklessly. It can be proven by a preponderance of evidence, but does not require evidence beyond a reasonable doubt like in criminal case. What is certainly not misconduct is an honest, unintentional error or a difference of opinion. The next slide shows you, I think, the relationship between true scientific productivity versus the emphasis on research quality and quantity. And here you, you have on the left side the quality and phases. And obviously, when you start to do your research, you are in this region here, but over time, you want to come to an optimum level where you have a decent productivity and you are not blocking your productivity by being too, uh, too particular with your research. On the other side, uh, if you start to publish tons of paper uh, and, and you don't pay attention to the quality of the paper, you are uh, you put your emphasis on the quantity, not on the quality, and you have a productivity loss uh, because some of your paper are, not, are rejected. I would mention that the, the colleagues that have been uh, reported as, uh, as publishing a lot of made-up papers are in this category. Classically, our, our colleagues that have been uh, a published paper made up and a large number of paper. So I, I think this is very important. You want to try to keep your uh, the activity of your lab or your clinical research at this optimal level. Uh, the next slide shows you the replication and generalization of time. When you discover something, you have a, a, a commitment to repl replicability, which is very critical. And you want to make sure that what you discover as can be generalized to a certain level. If you continue to do research and you have uh, what you are seeing is the replicability increase, the generalability of the data may not increase and, and only cover a certain area of uh, the research that you are doing. 
However, if you repl replicate your data and you have a failure to replication, what you are seeing is that your replicability goes to zero, but also the generalizability uh, disappears. I think this indicates that it is very important to have a replication of the data, uh, particularly when they are questioning the current practice. The next slide asks you uh, uh, the following question. To whom do we owe the truth and why uh, in research? We owe the truth to the public because largely uh, the research, at least in, in, uh, in America, is funded by the NIH, which is the federal government. Indiv uh, individual research participants, uh, uh, you know, we owe them, particularly people that work with you, out of respect for their autonomy. Colleagues and collaborators, whose research may be based on your research, and if the data are made up and are incorrect, they may uh, go in the wrong direction, and this is not acceptable. Obviously, the funding institution that are giving us the resources, these are largely our tax dollars. Also, the research institution and university, our employers, for employment resources and because the reputation can be affected by what we are doing. Clearly, many obligations of research stems from its nature and the pursuit of truth and knowledge. So in conclusion, I would say that the basic principle in conducting research is that research should pursue the whole truth and nothing but the truth. But as an editor-in-chief of uh, uh, one of the important anesthesia journal, I still believe that researchers are always innocent until proven guilty, not guilty until proven innocent. Thank you very much for uh, spending a few minutes with me. It's a pleasure to be part of the panel today about maximizing your scientific impact. I was asked to discuss self-promotion on social media, so we're going to jump right into this topic, which may not sound like a great idea. Um, most of us have probably been taught not to self-promote, um, but I'm going to discuss hopefully some strategies that make it more, much more constructive and hopefully um, add some benefit to your academic career. I have no financial disclosures. And let's just start out with um, hopefully a, a positive topic, which is you just published a paper. So after months and months and months of work, um, organizing all of your collaborators, you know, after you've crunched the numbers and you've written your manuscript, you've gone through the review process, you've survived the multiple rounds of revision, and you get this paper published in a competitive journal. So what happens next? Unfortunately, some of the statistics are a little bit scary. And this is an article from Smithsonian Magazine that says that half of academic papers are only read by their authors and the journal editors, which is pretty distressing, I think, as um, an academic uh, physician and scientist. Um, you do a lot of these projects, uh, your passion projects, to try to share information and hopefully impact care that patients receive. So how do you let people know about your work? I think there are many traditional ways of doing this, but I think that we also uh, live in a modern age where um, we use digital tools all the time. So why shouldn't this be an area where we try to leverage the power of digital tools? This is an interesting article that was uh, published in the Journal of Medical and Internet Research that looks at the correlation between highly tweeted papers and eventual citations. And I pulled up this figure just because I think it's fairly fairly obvious you know, what the time lag is between social media attention and the eventual citations. So once a paper comes out, if that is highly tweeted, if the authors, if other scientists, uh, if physicians in that particular area are talking about it on social media platforms, that generates a lot of attention initially, immediately after the paper comes out. 
it takes a long time for that citation or for that paper to actually get cited in a paper, as you can see here. Um, it really doesn't pick up for about 300 days. Um, and that's not surprising because in order for a paper to get cited, it has to be read by others who are actually in the process of writing another paper. And then that paper that cites the paper that you published has to go through the submission, the review process, and then eventually get published into a journal to count as a citation. And so that lag, not surprisingly, is at a minimum months, and but can actually be in the order of years. And why do citations matter? Is if you're in, in an academic department and you're looking at the development of reputation as the means to try to demonstrate your criteria for promotion, then citations matter. They, they matter not just um, to you as an individual, because of course, you know, we, we also are rated by our citations in academics, looking at our H indices um, or I-10 index, but we also know that the journals care a lot about citations as well, because citations um, in comparison to the number of cited works goes into the impact factor. And the impact factor determines the ranking of that journal, which is very important to journals and journal publishers. So I thought I would talk about social media um, in the positive light and talk specifically about potential benefits you know, for academic physicians. And then I'm gonna, I'll give you a few practical tips um, in this short time that we have. So let's first talk about some of the social media benefits. We know that social media really encompasses a universe of online applications. They include websites, they include apps on mobile devices that enable users to create and share content. Um, it, they can also be used for social networking. But this definition of creating and sharing content um, really includes a variety of different platforms, some of which maybe we haven't really thought about in terms of social media. And I'll give you some practical uh, examples of where I've found that social media has benefits. Now, I'm an academic uh, physician, and my specialty area of expertise is regional anesthesia and acute pain medicine. And just in my particular niche field, I tried to look at how many articles there are to try to keep up with. And yeah, this is a figure that we included in an editorial where we just looked at the number of PubMed cited uh, references that included plain block in the title. And this is just one subset of regional anesthesia, but you can see in the last couple of years, there have been hundreds of articles per year published just using plain block. So you have to think, well, how are you keeping up with the literature and how are you leveraging these online tools to help curate information that will help you as a researcher and scientist? And I think when we think when we consider social media platforms, you know, they are ubiquitous and you know, the most common platforms continue to be uh, Facebook and YouTube, YouTube being number one. Um, but there's a, a number of platforms in this middle section, Instagram, LinkedIn, Twitter, um, TikTok, you know, that are rising in popularity, um, and a few of which have only been tracked by the Pew Institute for a year or two. Um, but I think the, the utilization of social media um, is becoming much more mainstream, and many of our trainees and even early career faculty have grown up with social media um, as the means for, uh, for social networking. And so this has become part of popular culture culture and is also transforming the way that we view um, academic medicine and science. So YouTube is not a big platform that I use, although I have a YouTube channel. Um, during the COVID pandemic, this became a good place for me to house some of the recorded lectures that I had um, as all of our live meetings went online. Um, and, and I think that this is also a good place to use some of those educational materials to help further your reputation as well. You know, many of our talks that we spend hours and hours and hours preparing for, you know, they'll only be heard by a limited number of people in the audience. Um, some some of our uh, talks that we give internally for our trainees or for our own department um, will end up just living on your computer, um, where if you actually took the time to try to record that talk and then upload it on YouTube, then that now becomes something that uh, can be shared with others that uh, many others around the world can learn from and also can help further your reputation as an expert in that particular domain. 
Now, I think in terms of social media, because there are so many platforms, most people tend to break down their use of certain platforms for personal versus professional use. So for example, Facebook, and Instagram are commonly used for personal use. And while you know, many people, um, at least you know, that uh, as a result of this very small survey, you know, will attest to using Twitter for professional use. Uh, my own personal bias is that I tend to prefer using uh, Twitter for professional use only. Now, the use of Twitter is relatively new for me. I mean, I only started using it um, in 2013, and it was in relationship to um, an academic meeting that was occurring at the time. Um, and over the over the years, I've learned um, you know, much more about the Twitter culture and how to leverage it um, in a way that not only is um, enriching for me as a physician and as a researcher, um, but also allows me to share my ideas, thoughts, and also support others um, through various types of campaigns that are shared through social media. Um, I've written a number of different articles about how you can leverage social media and specifically the Twitter platform for physicians and researchers. And so I just refer you to um, you know, this particular article and others. But uh, I would just summarize by saying that um, there is a huge advantage to using these types of social media platforms and specifically Twitter to have real time global interactions to have conversations with experts colleagues in the same field or other fields outside of your domain um, for real real time almost real time interaction um, for learning and networking uh, for answering questions for posing questions and this really helps enrich um, your particular career um, as it has mine just because we're all lifelong learners. And I think that we can all learn from each other, um, as well as uh, consider various perspectives on uh, and various and different areas in science. I also think that you know, the the positive use of social media, especially for um, a, re a researcher or scientist who's trying to produce academic work that changes practice, um, is very important. They should go together. So yeah, I mentioned before from the same paper that this idea of public interest of generating those tweetations, you know, that social media sharing, and um, that actually can lead and is highly correlated. Um, with citations down the road. And it makes sense, I think, for a couple of reasons. I think this is bi-directional. So on the one hand, if you have a, uh, an article that you publish that's in a, a hot area of science, then that should generate some attention. The, the more attention that gets, the more people are likely to read it. And then more likely that similar researchers in the same field will incorporate that reference into their manuscript and eventual publication. And then that paper gets cited. In addition, if you're using social media and, and paying attention and engaging in conversation where you're not just a passive user um, in which you're just uh, putting out self-promoting activity or just consuming um, social media from uh, as a you know, using it as a news feed, then you're actually contributing to conversations and you're paying attention to what's timely. And so, yeah, I think the observation aspect of social media, um, observing, engaging in conversation allows you as a researcher um, to know which topics are of interest um, and may be worth pursuing in terms of future studies. The journals also pay attention to social media shares as well. And many of our popular journals have the Altmetric score and Altmetric is a London based company, um, but that score incorporates in many of the other outlets that um, that are that showcase a particular paper. So far in advance of, uh, of an actual citation, you'll see shares on social media platforms, you see how they're broken down by uh, Facebook, by Twitter, um, also blog posts that discuss a particular paper. Um, in addition, you know, lay, lay news press or, or news outlets, um, you know, also, you know, they also factor into the altmetric score and can really drive an altmetric score. Uh, this particular paper in regional anesthesia and pain medicine by Dr. Graff and colleagues at the University of Pennsylvania um, has the highest altmetric score in regional anesthesia and pain medicine journals history. Um, and Dr. Graff was interviewed on the BBC and it was covered by other mainstream news outlets um, that really drew a lot of attention to this one particular article. And this is just a single n equals one case study. This is my uh, publication history and citation history since I started my academic career. I didn't publish my first paper until I was an attending. I didn't know that I was going to be interested in academic medicine as a trainee. And so my first case report in 2004 uh, was published after I'd finished my training. And then I went and I did a master's in clinical research while I was working as an attending at UC San Diego. 
Uh, but since then, um, yeah, I've been involved in a number of clinical trials as well as other projects um, that have led to publication. And you can see where I started my Twitter account in 2013. And of course, this is not causal by any means. Um, but as I mentioned, I think that there is something bidirectional about the use of social media. I think on the one hand, uh, when you publish a paper that's timely and topical, you can share that and you can also include and mention people who may be interested in the same field to start discussing your article. That also allows people who are in the same area of science to know about your paper and then consider referencing it. So that way it gets cited later. And you can see how that trend of publications and citations increases together. Um, and I think in addition, as I mentioned, as a researcher on social media, I'm using it because I use Twitter regularly. I also pay close attention to what people are talking about. So that helps me understand which topics are timely and which ones may be worth pursuing, um, either as a research study um, or other form of, of manuscript. And this is just one practical example. Um, I've had many, but this is one that uh, that comes to mind very quickly. Um, there was a Twitter conversation a couple of years ago about uh, how the regional anesthesia field has changed so much, and yet the minimum requirements for peripheral nerve block experience for our residents in the United States through ACGME haven't changed. We still are required to have a minimum of 40 experiences managing patients with peripheral nerve blocks. Well, when I was a resident and we didn't have ultrasound and people didn't put catheters in, you could realistically do four different blocks 10 times each, and maybe you would feel proficient in performing those four blocks. But today with ultrasound, you can put local anesthetic anywhere. And so you could realistically have 40 different nerve blocks and have only performed them one time each. And so um, a friend and colleague of mine, Lloyd Turbett, who's an anesthetist um, in Belfast, had commented that 100% of an anesthesiologists who are competent in five blocks is better than having 1% of anesthesiologists competent in 100 blocks. And it goes to the importance, I think, of trying to spread what we do to impact patient care. And this led to an, an editorial that uh, Lloyd and I, as well as um, you know, Dr. Kareem El Bogdali, who's a consultant anesthetist at Guys and St. Thomas's Trust in London, you know, wrote for the journal Anesthesia. Um, that editorial, um, it really formed the basis of the Regional Anesthesia United Kingdom's uh, Plan A Blocks um, you know, workshop uh, direction, as well as um, cognitive aids to help uh, further um, promote basic blocks you know, for all anesthesiologists. Um, that led to an international study in which you know, we put together a group of experts around the world to, using a Delphi process to try to determine you know, what would be um, a basic non-fellowship curriculum you know, for regional anesthesia, for any anesthesiologist. And this was uh, published in Regional Anesthesia and Pain Medicine at the conclusion of, it, of that work. So let's just talk about a couple practical tips uh, and then I'll uh, leave, the, leave the rest for the discussion. So a couple of things I think that are very important to remember. So social media um, is never an emergency. So yeah, anytime that you're not sure about posting or tweeting, then just pause. Think about it. Yeah, don't do it when you're emotional. Um, make sure that you're accurate. Um, I like to proofread over and over and over um, before um, I send any, I post anything on Instagram or, or I uh, tweet um, anything. I think it's important that you respect patient privacy. So that is an absolute uh, absolute rule for social media um, in the healthcare setting. And I also think that, you know, that sometimes social media posts lack nuance. So always assume good um, you know, unless proven otherwise and just uh, educate yourself. So spend some time observing um, before you start to engage in conversation. So a couple of things I think are easy on the to-do list. So I'm personally biased towards the use of Twitter. I find it very helpful um, as an academic physician. Um, also the size of the post is small, so it's easily digestible. Um, so I would recommend just starting your account um, and then edit the handle. So initially your username is um, some element of your name plus a bunch of numbers. So edit that so that way it includes your full name and degrees. Write a brief profile just so that way people know that it's you. Um, if you happen to be giving a presentation or you write a paper, um, yeah, if you're someone like me, I always try to see if those people are on Twitter. So that way when I share their work, um, either at a meeting or I'm going to tweet about a paper that they publish, I like to give them credit. Um, add a photo again so that way people can identify who you are and just follow a couple of accounts and see how people use that platform um, and you learn a lot about um, you know, the etiquette on that type of a, a social media format. 
And if you get to tweeting, then here are a couple of pro tips. And this is from a friend and colleague, Jeff Gadsden, who's at Duke University. Um, make sure if you're at a meeting like this one, that you include the relevant hashtag. So uh, the meeting, um, meeting planners you know, should um, always advertise with the meeting hashtag on all of their materials and websites. So that way attendees always know if there's a, a hashtag being used. Uh, this helps group the conversations for that meeting and makes them easily searchable. And if you have a topic that you think is of interest to other people, then mention them. As I mentioned, as I said earlier, if you have um, a paper that people are uh, talking about, or you know that someone has published a paper, then I usually include their uh, Twitter handle in my in my tweet. Um, also include images. So images yeah, are known to draw more attention to a particular post, um, and they're more likely to be retweeted. And then you can also use that uh, that image to tag other people. So in case you, there are many other um, accounts uh, and, and people who may be interested in that particular topic, you can help draw attention to your tweet um, using the tag feature. The other thing that I just want to say, even though my topic is self-promotion, is that it really shouldn't be about self-promotion only. Um, use social media for good, use it to promote others. You know, find people who are doing great work um, and elevate them. And this is really a great opportunity. As you start to gain followers, then you start to have an audience. And that's a, I, I find that is uh, one of our obligations, I think, to try to uh, lift others up you know, who are doing great things and really are deserving of that kind of attention. So so I've tried to use my own social media platforms to help promote other people, to help promote uh, underrepresented uh, minorities and women in medicine and science, um, as well as try to um, draw a rightful attention to causes and campaigns um, that you know, help elevate others and try to um, create equity in, in medicine and science. And if you have any questions about getting started on social media, this is a page on my website that gives some hope, uh, some basic tips and tricks, as well as some links to some helpful resources. And of course, I'm always easy to find if any of you have any questions about the use of social media. Um, you know, there are no there are no dumb questions. So um, anyone getting started is is welcome to come and reach out to me as well. Yeah, thank you so much for being part of the session. Great, thanks so much for uh, joining me here today. It's an absolute pleasure. Before we get started, I just want you to pause and ask, I just wanna ask a simple question. What are you afraid of? What's your top fear? Is it heights? Could it be snakes? Maybe it's flying? And you might be wondering, well, that's kind of a crazy question to start this topic with, but it brings me to this gentleman. And I'm not sure if you know who this is, but his name is Jerry Seinfeld and he's a comedian. And he has a joke and he says, you know, the recent survey showed that what are people afraid of? Well, number one was public speaking. Number two was actually death. So the joke is that if you're at a funeral, most people would actually prefer to be in the casket than to be giving the eulogy. So well, what does that mean for me? Well, I am public speaking on public speaking. So it's a little intimidating to be here today. When I get scared, I always ask questions. So I think to myself, well, if you were me, what would you include in this presentation? And I want you to think about the worst presentations you've seen and the best presentations you've seen. And I would argue that the worst presentations are easy, right? The person spoke too fast. They went on too long. Their slides were way too busy. But the best presentations are a little bit harder to figure out because when someone gives a very good presentation, you're not thinking about their presentation skills. You're actually listening to the topic about which they are speaking. So. I think for today, it might make sense to cover common mistakes and general tips. What I want, you know, the virtual tips is a whole other talk and we don't have time for that today, but I'm happy to come back at another time and talk about that. So as we look at this, before I start anything, I want you to look at this slide. This is probably the most important slide. Whenever you give a presentation, I don't want you to think about you talking to someone. I want you to think about it as a conversation with the audience, whether or not the audience is five people and you're live or 2000 people and you're virtual. It's always about a conversation. And what do you do in a conversation? Well, you ask questions, right? If you have a conversation, it's not one person just speaking constantly without asking any questions. And you can always ask questions, even if it's a large audience or a small audience. If you want to ask questions to a large audience and it's virtual, so they can't really answer you very quickly and uh, easily, 
what you do is you ask a question and then you pause for just a second and get the audience thinking because at least that engages them in the conversation and how did i do that today well i already said tell me what you're afraid of right i paused a little bit so you could answer and then i tried to engage you in what do you think we should include today? Think about the worst things you've seen and the best presentations you've seen. And I tried to engage you in the conversation. So those are just some little tips. I always ask questions. You need to know your audience. You're gonna have a very different conversation with a first grader than you are with a PhD candidate. So you need to know your audience. You need to make sure that you keep in mind culture, age variability, and language. One thing to do is keep everything very generic. And let me show you, uh, I will tell you that I happen to be a cardiac anesthesiologist. When I was very junior, I gave lots of talks and I would describe the bicuspid aortic valve, which is a congenital abnormality. And it has a little bit of an odd shape. And how I used to describe the shape is as a football. I grew up in Ohio, a football is a football. And I realized I had lots of questions if I was doing an international meeting because of course it dawned on me after I knew I was doing something wrong when I was getting lots of questions. And then it dawned on me at international around the world, a football very often looks like what I would call a soccer ball, right? It's a circle. It doesn't look like that football shape that I'm talking about from you know middle America. So I then converted to something that was much more generic. And so now I say it's a fish mouth because that, a fish mouth is a fish mouth all the way around the world. So if you have one take home message from sort of, you know, how to deal with culture, language, age and language, it's to keep everything generic. What about humor? I would say, you know, natural humor goes a long way. It's great to have a conversation where you're laughing, right? But scripted humor, not so much. I just don't think it, it goes well. And keep in mind, if you're not naturally funny and it doesn't naturally come about, it is not necessary. You are not there to be a stand-up comedian. You are there to present your information. So humor is great as long as it's natural, but you don't have to be a stand-up comedian. That's somebody else's job. What about a cartoon? So many people say, I like to add humor by adding a cartoon. It's totally fine. I would say it's a personal choice. I usually don't do it. And I tell you why I usually don't do it. When you put a cartoon up, here's what happens. The audience looks at the cartoon. They first look at the imagery. So they see two people, they see an animal, the animal's moving, there's a banana peel, and they, they're trying to process the imagery. Then they look down and say, oh, well, what's the joke, right? What's the verbiage? Then they say, what is the verbiage? How does that pertain to the imagery? And then they say, oh, that's fine. Then the next thing they have to do is say, okay, I get the cartoon. Now I have to see how that cartoon pertains to what the, the presenter is talking about. So I'm making that sound like that takes a long time. It doesn't take a long time. It takes three to five seconds for your brain to do that. But as you're doing that, you're not really paying attention to the to the uh, to what the speaker is talking about. So if you like cartoons and you think it's important, certainly use it. But I would say put the cartoon up, give the audience three to five seconds to actually read the cartoon, and then press on to your next slide that has your information on it. What about a picture? Is a picture a good idea? People say a picture is worth a thousand words. I love pictures. I think they're great. I do some talking with trainees on the basics of TEE, so transesophageal echocardiography, and I can either describe the whole process or show a simple picture and say, okay, it's a probe. It's like a GI probe. It goes in the back of the throat into the esophagus, and then the heart rests right on top of the esophagus, and I can get ultrasound images. So pictures are spectacular. One of my mentors said, think of words as short-term memory and pictures as long-term memory. So I'm hoping you remember some of what I say in a year, but more than likely you're going to remember pictures longer than actually what I'm saying. Uh, pictures are spectacular. What about movies or videos? Is that worth a million words then? So movies are great. Videos are great. Be careful for what you wish for though. I would argue have, I would argue that probably most people in the audience have been in an audience where somebody wants to show a video and it doesn't play or you can't hear the sound or it doesn't play as smoothly as you would want it to. So I would say, if you need to put it in, put it in, but there are certain caveats to it. 
it's a personal choice. So if you want to add a movie, you need to practice, practice, practice. And what does that mean? Well, if you're live, you need to go to the speaker ready room. You go to the speaker ready room and make sure that your video plays with the equipment that they have there. If it's a virtual situation, you need to practice that. You need to get on the link 20 minutes ahead of time and make sure that the video runs with the bandwidth that the, um, that the system has in place. So you always have to practice. I like to label things. I like to label before I speak. So I'll show you. This is, if I were talking to a trainee, I would say this is a TEE ultrasound image. There's the right side of the heart and the left side of the heart. And between the two ventricles is the septal wall. And then I'm going to play the movie, right? So here's the movie. And this is essentially normal ejection fraction. So again, what I've done is I label things. I speak and then I play the movie. The other thing is I play one movie at a time, unless you want to compare and comparisons are great. So if I want to compare normal to this one and I'll say to a medical student, well, how does that look? And most of the medical students, even if they've seen the first movie once and then they see this, they say, well, that ejection fraction looks horrible. That's easy for me to see. Now I want you to pause and just look at this slide and say, is that a busy slide? That's a very busy slide. If I show you all of this all at once, your eyes don't know where to go. The very first thing you're going to look at is the two moving images. You're going to say, okay, here's the movie. Then you're going to look at the labels. Then you might look at what's on the left side, but it can be a little bit confusing. And I'm hoping that this was not confusing to you. And, I, and I'll tell you, this has to do a little bit of what I call slide mastery, because I hope I eased you into that. So as I think of slide mastery, one of the things is you need to always make sure that you keep the audience's attention. You want them to listen and not read, and they can't do both. So if it is written there, so if it's there, the audience will read. A very simple way of thinking about it, if you think of eyes versus ears, the eyes win every time. The eyes are going to go straight for what's ever on the slide. So I like to play a little game of hide and seek. And what does that mean? Well, that means when I talk to the audience, I show the audience only what I want to show them when I want them to read it. So I basically go step by step and add information, which is what I did here. I started with a very basic slide and got to a very busy slide, but I'm hoping that I walked you through that so that you weren't overwhelmed. So that's just step by step as you add information. The other thing is, is you should keep your slides as very simple as possible. And I'll give you an example of that. I very, rarely, I very rarely use sentences. So there was a recent case where a resident came to me and said, oh, I, I'm going to present a case. Do you mind taking a look at it? I said, oh, gosh, you know, I'm happy to take a look at it. So they did a great job of gathering the information, but this is how they had presented it. Well, lots of sentences. And I said, wow, that's great information, but let's, let's, let's tidy it up a bit. Why don't we try this? There's a 52-year-old female who has a history of hypertension and nicotine abuse. They came to the ER at 3 in the morning with this sudden back pain. It would seem to be severe and consistent and constant. They admitted they had dizziness, but no syncope. And then if you looked at their past medical history, they didn't really have any uh, weakness, headache, shortness of breath, no previous episodes, and no trauma. So for me, that looks and reads much easier than sort of all of these sentences that have the same information, but it's just not as pleasing to the eyes or to the ears. So I avoid sentences at all costs. In terms of audience attention, I always ask uh, sort of trainees if I'm helping them with this. You have the intro, you have the presentations, your actual presentation with the facts, your life story, and then you have the conclusion. And you're going to practice which one is the most important to practice. Most people will say either the facts, because that's their life work, or they'll say conclusion, because that's the last thing that audiences know as you conclude your presentation. Interestingly enough, it's really, if I said, what do you want to get right, really it should be the introduction. So the introduction is very important because there's a lot of distractors out there. If I get started talking and I do not gather your information within a very short period of time, and some studies will say 10 seconds, a recent study said seven seconds before an audience decides whether or not I'm going to pay attention to you, right? Because otherwise you start to look at uh, who's going to pick up the kids tonight? Do we have the latest recipe uh, for dinner, right? There's lots of different distractors out there. So you need to gather their uh, attention right away. You need to, for an introduction, you need to practice, practice, practice. It should be as flawless as you possibly can to get, grab the information, grab the audience's attention right away. 
Now, what about the facts? What if you have to present facts and it's fact heavy? Because sometimes that can be challenging. I'm just going to show you one example that I have. So if you look at the aortic valve and they're saying, gosh, the bicuspid versus tricuspid, what many people do is they copy and paste. Now, if you copy and paste, this is what it looks like, and it looks a little busy. What I like to do, and I call it the Brady way, I, I don't have a better term for it, is I like to show it like this. And what do I do? Well, very often I tidy up the graft and I try to make it a little bit more pleasing. The other thing I very often do, I spoil the ending. So let me walk you through this. I sometimes will do the take home message first. So I'll say this author looked at tricuspid versus bicuspid, and they really thought tricuspids were going to be far out better than bicuspid valve. But it turns out that tricuspids did better than bicuspids, but not as by much as they thought. And what does that look like? Well, here's the graph. If you look at all cause mortality, bicuspids definitely had worse in terms of mortality, but not much more than tricuspids. Now, if I look at that graph in comparison to this one, it looks very different. The information is the same, but I've changed it to look a little bit more pleasing. And so what does that mean? Well, I got rid of things that I don't need. If you need it, you need to leave it in place, but I got rid of that. The other thing is when you look at the words and the numbers, if you blow them up in a PowerPoint, they tend to blur. So what do I do? I insert all the words and all the numbers. I insert a text box and retype all of this. So what does that mean? I'll just give you one example. I do early generation devices and then I move it over. And so what does that end up looking like? It ends up looking like this. It's much prettier on your eyes. It this The graft is exactly the same. So the data is the same, but it just looks prettier on your eyes and easy to understand, especially in light of the fact that we already did the take home message first. The other thing I just briefly will mention, if they looked at the original graft, when you say, okay, bi bicuspid versus tricuspid, I had to look down below to figure out which graft we were talking about, right? So for me, what I did is I said, I'm gonna get rid of that. I'm just gonna change this wording to red, the same you know, number, 14.5%, and then this is tricuspid. So this is exactly the same, it's just easier to read. So I like to tidy things up. In terms of the conclusion, I think in conclusion is incredibly important. You need to practice it. It is the last thing that people will see uh, when they leave the auditorium or when they turn off their Zoom, their virtual meeting. Why should a presentation be flawless? You have done so much work and every presentation is essentially a job interview. I love it when I help people with a presentation and they say, oh my gosh, I gave the presentation and somebody came up afterward and they wanna collaborate with me, right? Or somebody came up and said, hey, can you give that grant at our, grand rounds at our institution, that is like an opportunity that you didn't have five minutes earlier, right? And, or sometimes those, you know, people will say, gosh, you know, you were trying to get more staff and they say, wow, you made a really great, uh, really great point. I'll, we'll give you that extra staff on Friday. That's certainly important. So I would say, keep in mind, a presentation is a job interview. You have done so much work. You've done all this research. The presentation is part of that job interview. You don't want to do all this work and have it go, go for naught. I would say practice never enough. You need to get on in that podium or practice live at least 10 times before you think about it. Timing, it can never be short. Nobody ever says, oh, I wish they went on five minutes longer, so I'll be late for the going to the operating room. It's never short enough. Feedback, you need to get feedback from colleagues, residents, and fellows. I joke that uh, I got feedback from my daughters. They have heard so many echo talks from me. I used to pay them a dollar and say, did I talk too fast? Did I use um? Uh, tell me what you think. I'm sure they're, they're now in college, so they look very different. And nowadays you can practice uh, on Zoom recording, hear your voice. It really helps in terms of timing as well. And you can sort of hear, are you going too fast? Or are you going too slow? How does it sound to you? So let's go back to the beginning. Remember I said, gosh, if you were me, what would you include? So let's recap, what did I include? Well, keep everything generic. Cartoons are okay, pictures are great. Uh, movies, right, movies, but there are some caveats to that. And that led us to that slide mastery. And really when you're putting together the slides, just remember eyes win over ears every time. So keep it as simple as possible. And we talked a little bit about how to make some of our fact heavy presentations a little bit easier to understand and then why it's important to practice. So I wanna thank you very much for the time. I can't tell you uh, what a pleasure it's been to be here. I have left my email in case you have any questions whatsoever. Thank you to all the presenters for those wonderful presentations. Um, 
<clears throat> I wanted to um, start the Q&A. We um, are short on time, but uh, I confirmed we can go to 1.25. Um, so we, we do have about 12 minutes for, for questions. I know that Jamie started with a question for doc, Dr. Petit. Um, Jamie Fravatsky said, thanks for the great talk. I'd um, imagine the answer is no, but is there any effort to standardize format, formatting between journals, at least on initial uh, submission? I think we all can um, agree that it's annoying to reformat for multiple submissions. And I'm also curious myself, is there is there an initiative where where we will be able to sort of take one submission and if it, uh, you know, easily transition it to another another journal in the future. Well, thank you for the question. Uh, I, I do agree, I'm an author too, and uh, I, I get angry, although as my colleague just said, don't be, but uh, uh, I get sometimes angry when I, you know, it's rare that your uh, paper is accepted the first time immediately. So you have to resubmit. The, the, the problem is that we, we are expecting a, a certain number of uh, things to be done. Uh, I'll give you an example. For example, uh, I had a question for a manuscript about misconduct and by somebody outside uh, our editorial board sent me an email and said, this paper that you just published, PAP, uh, Head of Print, may, may be a misconduct issue. Well, we went back to the, it was a clinical trial. We went back to the, to the, the clinicaltrial.gov uh, document, and, but it was not, a, we, we didn't look at it initially, and there were some differences. The good news is there are no major differences, and it won't be, it or not, that is not misconduct. But, you know, we will now for a clinical trial requ require that the author send us the link. So we had over the, the years several uh, issues uh, uh, that we need in order to make a final decision about the paper. But I do agree, we are trying the best we can. We are dealing with editorial manager, and editorial manager is not perfect. As you know, there are very few uh, uh, websites that you can use to submit paper. Uh, uh, I would like also to thank you first for inviting me and make two comments. Uh, Vesna challenged the, the, the journals before in her talk, superb talk, and said, what can you do for women? Well, I like to talk about our journal, two things. We nominate a DEI editor uh, at the top of the, the, the leadership of this journal, is Paloma Toledo, and she will review for our journal, the editor, all the editor and reviewer, who they are. Are they women? Are they men? Well, who they are? And I think it's a very important step. We are the first anesthesia journal to do this. Number two, uh, the, for Dr. Mariano, we just nominate two young colleagues as uh, angling editor for social media. I completely agree with him that we can do better. We had a colleague that, that did before, but he became sick. He has to, uh, to quit. And uh, now we picked up two young, motivated women, actually, to develop the, the presence of the journal in social media. So thank you very much. Um, that's, that's really great to hear. And I'm, I'm excited for the, the future and anesthesia and analgesia, and the journal. Um, I uh, wanted to mention that uh, Dr. Mariano uh, is at the, the ASRA meeting and uh, probably uh, he, I don't think he made it to, to the Q&A session. He said he might have been unable to. So I noted there was a significant amount of questions for him about uh, social media engagement. Um, uh, we can, we can kind of discuss those amongst ourselves, but while um, uh, we can wait wait a few minutes for that, but we can discuss a couple of those. Additionally, um, a question for Dr. Brady, um, and uh, this is uh, Dr. Hoff posed a question. Dr. Brady, you definitely have the presentation skills to give this talk. Have you learned to use a more building block approach because many in the audience appreciate it? I'm in the minority with intuitive preferences and find it very difficult to process the building blocks without the context, so I prefer to see all the points at once. How do you use building blocks or people like me to make sure I have somewhere to put them? And I, I assume she's talking about sort of outlining your talk a little more ahead of time, um, but I'm not, I'm not totally sure there. 
Um, so if the, is the questioner on the um, on the meeting? Because I'm not 100% sure what you're asking. So oh, I, I think you're there. There she is. She, if you want to. I got to turn up. my microphone on. You were talking about um, showing one point at a time and building your slide up and hiding everything else so that people are paying attention. I find that just makes me angry because. I'm like, but I want to know what the whole picture is. What's the answer? Why is she only giving me these little bits that mean nothing? And I can't remember them for a minute. Um, and so I know I'm unusual. And, and so I used to get a lot of criticism for like showing the big picture. And then people would be like, but what are the building blocks? So I've tried to put more building blocks in it, but I just would just give you that my, and I, I think you did it really nicely. So I wasn't feeling angry at the way you did it. So are there tips for how to show a bit, but somehow give the context so people aren't feeling cheated? Um, so I would say that there is no absolute wrong, right or wrong answer. And I very often say my only disclosure at the beginning of a talk is that honestly, this is, there is some science behind it, but there is also my opinion. And so most of it is my opinion. So if you like doing something a certain way, it doesn't mean that it is unusual or incorrect. So if you like receiving that information in that way, and you get a positive response from those with whom, you know, from the audience, then continue to do it in sort of that big building block. I will say it's important if you have a lot of information on the slide to keep the point simple. Like if you're not gonna sort of do it one by one, just make sure that what they are reading is very, very simple. But these are my preferences. Um, so if you like to do it in a certain fashion, it doesn't mean that it's incorrect. I would also like to say that a key to, um, Sort of teasing out whether or not you are sort of what the audience feels you need to get feedback from the audience so if you can get feedback at any point after you give a presentation and it needs to be honest feedback it can't be like oh that was a great job right you need to say you know what did i do well and what did i do wrong and so if you find that the if your slides are simple but you present all the information as one big block and they understand it you don't need to change a thing I, I was I, speaking of me as an audience member, not me as a speaker. Sure, sure. And so as a, but well, yes. So, and some, it could, you may not be alone. So I'm curious to see what other people think. You may not be alone and that people want to see everything all at once. I really, um, I, I, I guess a, a similar topic. I really uh, appreciated the, mentioned that pictures kind of put things in the long-term memory I, that, that resonated with me quite a bit. And it made me realize when, when I build talks, I try to find a picture. And sometimes, you know, a lot of the clinical translational research that I'm interested in, so much of the multivariate models are just tables and there's no pictures. And I'm like, oh man. And you end up looking through tons of different publications and you find that one that has the picture and that's the one that goes in your talk or you can build you could build something based off of what the what you have in other publications and say adapted from the but I'm, I'm sort of curious and this is a question for both of you um is there do you kind of emphasize you know when when publishing work creating maybe some 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 picture or some some uh, figure that would kind of represent the overall findings of that work that would be a little more, you know, understandable and um, you know easier to disseminate than than a lot of words and tables. Yeah, I, I can answer this uh, for at least for our journal. We have in each issue we have two infographic uh, that are uh, made from the, the the best article, what we consider the best articles uh, published in uh, in that issue of the journal. In addition, we have started now several months ago to do visual abstract. The visual abstract is simpler than infographic, but I think we are publishing uh, several uh, every month. And I think we we try. I do agree with you uh, that that is done in basic science. Generally, in, in generally in basic science, is the last figure of the the paper, right? When you have the cartoon explaining what you did. But I think it can be also done for clinical research so that uh, particularly when the clinical research is a little complicated, you know, you really want to know what is the goal of the study and what are the results. There is another reason that I think very important for myself is that the visual, you, in developing country, they don't have a lot of computer, they have cell phones. And you can send a visual abstract or an infographic by uh, 
uh, to cell phone in developing countries. So you can, and there are not a lot of words, so you don't have the issue of translation in multiple languages. So I think this is, was another reason, not the only one, but another reason why we have decided to push for it. Yeah, that, that makes sense. And I definitely um, like the infographics that I, I've seen more, more and more of those. Um, question for Dr. Brady by uh, Mike, Mike, Michael Mathis. Um, do you recommend different approaches for novice versus experienced presenters? For mentees that are presenting for the first time, I've traditionally coached that having a PowerPoint very rehearse is okay um, with goal to build confidence. Then you can dial back and improve some of the performative, performance aspects of the presentation as confidence experience grows. Um, would you agree or suggest a different approach? And um, I would almost add on another question is, you know, how much time do you balance with presentation versus um, getting the stuff, getting your science ready for publication too? Because, you know, if you're spending a lot of time, you know, working on presentation skills and rehearsing, it, it becomes, um, you know, kind of a drag on, on publishing and disseminating that work in a different format. But um, sorry, that's, there's a lot of elements to that question, but um I guess well, I think you can't. So thanks for the question. And again, thanks for having me here. I think you you can't present anything until you have something to present. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so you need to um, you you need to work on, you know, whether or not it's pre publication or, you know, or already published, you need to have something about which you are considered to be um, somewhat of an expert, but I would say that we give a lot of opportunities to, you know, we have a speaker exchange program and we have junior people who are not actually considered to be experts, but we want to give them opportunities to learn how to speak. Um, and certainly it helps them in, in terms of the promotion track. So I would say that if you're trying to balance between getting the presentation correct or actually be, you know, moving toward becoming an expert in the field, you need to move toward becoming an ex expert in the field. Um, I, but I, I will say that I very strongly believe that you, you can do years and years of work. And if you then present it in a very logical and easy to understand fashion, the opportunities will open up for you, which you might not even have realized. If you do tons and tons of work and you present it sort of half-heartedly or it's not well presented, you know, there are opportunities out there probably that you're going to miss. I, I will just say that it, it really is, in my mind, part of, a, you know, a job opportunity or a career opportunity, I should say. Um, I would say that. And then the other question I think was about coaching junior people. So I think it's, I, I, Mike, I'm not sure if I understood your question. You're more than welcome to uh, repeat it again. But if you're talking about coaching junior people, what I usually recommend is, well, I have a little, I have a curriculum in terms of presentation skills. So I usually guide them to that curriculum. I'm happy to share it if anybody on this um, uh, on this meeting is interested, just email me. Um, so I have a something that I have them listen to and go through. Uh, some of it has to do with virtual, some of it has to do with slide mastery and so I go and, or how to present scientific uh, information. So I have them start there and then I, pretty quickly we'll have the initial conversation and say, what are you going to talk about? What's your time frame? With whom are you speaking? Who's the audience? Who, what's the audience? And then I give them some guidelines. And then I ask them to put the PowerPoint together. And then before they do anything, I take a look at the PowerPoint. And then I have them practice presenting. And then I come back and have them practice present with me. It is not a short-term process. If I start from zero. With many people, they're very experienced and they, and they, you know, I'm starting not at zero, I'm starting at sort of eight. I don't know if that answers your question. And there are a lot of experts in the field on this, um, on this meeting. So please uh, speak up if anybody else has any suggestions. Well, I'm sorry to cut this short. I appreciate all the, the comments and guidance on presentation skills and the and um, all of the speakers' perspectives um, and presentations here, but we do have the next session, which I think will delay until 1.35. So we have a seven minute break um, to, to confirm with uh, Brad and Kim. And um, so we'll see you all back at 1.35 and you are all welcome to answer um, more questions in the chat if, if you can. And um, thanks again for, for speaking. I really learned a lot from your presentations and see you thank all at 1.35. Thank you so much for inviting me, okay, thank you. You're welcome. Thank you as well. Have a great day.